Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. I'm your host, Joshua, and I am so excited for you all to be here today. I'm really, really excited about this broadcast. I know I say it every time, but I am because I get to pick my guest, and I and I choose guests that I'm going to be excited about, and I do my best to try to choose guests from different walks of life that have different experiences and today is going to be really unique because I've never been able to really talk about this subject before, but I'm so excited about our guest, Mr. Adrian Emery. And let me tell you a little bit about our guest before I bring him on so you have reasons to be excited too. Adrian Emery is a talented male author. I don't know why I have male author on here. <laughs> talented male author and storyteller known for his compelling narratives and deep exploration of the human experience. He engages with his audiences through insightful blog and active presence on Instagram and Facebook. Adrian's writing often delves into themes of resilience, identity, and personal transformation, captivating readers with his authentic and emotional, resonant storytelling. With a passion for literature and an eye for detail, Adrian continues to inspire and connect with readers all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited to introduce to you all the way from Australia. Of course, if you're in Australia, that's not all the way. But for me in Oklahoma, Australia is all the way over there. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Adrian Emerson to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. Adrian, how are you? Thank you, Joshua. That was quite an amazing introduction, and I hope I can live up to that. But uh, yeah, I think that's pretty good. I'm I'm fantastic. And look, one of the things I would like to start with is you you say about being excited with every single person. I think we need to be excited every single moment and enjoy life the most that we can. You know. So I think it's thank you very much for this opportunity to have this conversation with you. Well, in the spirit of that statement, this leads into my first question, the very first question I ask everybody, what are you grateful for today and why? I am grateful for the fact, and I really focus on this, even though I know it's just a saying, I try to be grateful for every moment, for every breath, but basically I think I am most grateful for the gift of life. I believe that life is what you make it, and it's a fantastic opportunity, but gratitude is the key. And I think consciously, I really work hard on this to be more and more grateful every moment that I can. I love it. That's a good gratitude answer. I love it. I, I really do appreciate when I get a good gratitude answer because, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes I think we get lazy with our gratitude as humans. <laughs> So when someone gives me something of with meat and substance, I love it. But I think also people tend to uh, get lazy with their gratitude in terms of things, you know, look, oh, I'm grateful for this or I'm grateful for that. But how often are we just grateful for the pure fact of being, you know, to, to really go, wow, I look, maybe it, it can sound a little bit egotistical, but I'm really grateful for me that I'm here you know, that we are in this conversation right now. Everything is a joy. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Every day that I wake up, I, it's another day I get to pursue my dream. Yeah. And that is pretty amazing. All right. You ready for your 21 questions? I am ready. All right. <laughs> this is like a, a, uh, a quiz show. <laughs> yeah. It, well, no, there is some, so secretly there's a, there's a few reasons why this broadcast was created. And I actually thank the creator for giving me the download for it. But one of the reasons is because I it, there is a game show feel to it, and I love game shows. So <laughs> I love I love that you you said that you're the first person to actually say that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I thank you for that because that's how well, I see it. I'm just it. picking it's up on game. your energy, and and you know, it's I can see that it's a lot of fun, and and it's great, and I'm just gonna sit here and hopefully answer your questions. Maybe I, I might win. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually I'm going to get the giraffe. I'm going to be able to give away the giraffes. That that's going to happen at some point. That's that's a long story. Only only my audience will know what that means. All right. Yeah. First question. You argue that humanity stands at a crossroads and needs to reassess its fundamental reassess its fundamental premises. What do you believe are the most critical assumptions 
we need to reevaluate today. Right. Well, I'm going to pick up right from you with people powered renaissance. The fundamental assumption, the pillar of everything that I do is personal empowerment. First of all, and if you're going to have power to do anything, let's take a few easy examples, drive a car, or for us, working this technology to be able to sit here, cross continent, you, you need to be able to drive. So I think that humanity has lost the ability to drive what I call life, your life, my life. And uh, so I am very, very passionate about learning, teaching, and I've spent my whole life learning how to drive this thing called life because most people just take it for granted. I mean, if you talk to the average person, life, oh, yeah, life's a bitch. People don't have what I call a one-to-one -one business partnership with their life. So the fundamental assumption that we really need to change is what I would call the empowerment of the individual. You know, that I have power, I have agency, I can be in control of my life if I so choose, but I need to make that choice. So good. Now, before we go on, and I'm not going to go on to them, obviously that leads in to a lot of empowerment, but basically I think that's the fundamental change that we need to make is that I, as an individual, have agency. Mm, I think it's very powerful. Well said. Next question. In your book, Personal Sovereignty, Gosh, I struggle with that word. You discuss the persuasive misunderstanding of human existence. Can you elaborate on one major misconception that you think is most detrimental to our progress? Simple. Original sin. The concept of original sin. Now, that has many different definitions and guises in many different societies and religions, but basically it means that the individual is somehow and somewhere flawed at their core, that there is something wrong with us, that we are born. And you've only got to look at a newborn babe. I don't ever see any original sin. We all love newborn babes. They look so innocent. They look so pure. They look so loving and divine. I think that that then has many, many descendants, but the original premise that is wrong, going back to empowerment, how can I be empowered if I believe there's something wrong with me? Well, that was a really good question. I want to ask, I, this is not a planned question, but I need to ask, have you ever heard people discuss generational sin, generational curses, curses, sins of the father being passed oh, on to children? 100%, that's what personal sovereignty is all about. And I go into a lot of detail in personal sovereignty of exactly the mechanics, how by the sins of the father are passed on. It's totally a generational thing. It's the way we are brought up. And so, and I don't want to get too distracted here, but the overarching umbrella is what I call a paradigm. And so we are not only born with our genes and all different uh, biological DNA, we're also born into a paradigm. Now, a paradigm is a set of beliefs. We, both of us, are, you know, born into what I am calling a Western Judeo-Christian paradigm, which is a set of beliefs that via osmosis are very, very much surrounding the child as an infant and, and become that limiting factor. So we basically train, bring up, love, accept, don't accept, criticize, train, whatever, how, whichever area you want to look at, every single one of us goes through that process. And so the premises, the assumptions, and the beliefs are passed on from one generation to the next. Very good. I, and I had like 50 more questions that popped out of that, but we'll move on to the next one because that was good. What is the most common issue you encounter during your mentorship sessions and how do you typically address them? Right. The the biggest problem is not good enough, which obviously comes from the concept of original sin. I believe that we all have our unique, what I call not good enough. And when I was doing a lot of counseling, you really need to process. And it could take, I, some of my sessions were five hours. So I didn't do like one hour sessions every week. I don't believe that works. I think you've got to find and you've got to be able to define very, very accurately what is my 
personal, not good enough. Just like we both have our own faces, we have our unique fingerprint, we have our unique personality. We all have a very, very unique, not good enough. So that's the block. And working with a person, I need to really try and define that and find that because going back to the beginning about agency, you can only change something that you own. If you don't own it, you can't give it away. You can't change it. You don't have power over it. <laughs> it just kind of blew my mind a little bit. Okay. Good. That's what I'm here to do. And ho hopefully I can blow some other minds. <laughs> yeah, well, I got more questions at my mind blowing one. Um, <laughs> next question. How does the environment of the Blue Mountains and your retreat, Rustic Spirit, contribute to the transformative experiences of your guest? Very good question. I love that question. So the whole theme of my existence now is the power of nature to transform people. I believe, and, and part of our theme for Rustic Spirit, but my, the theme in my life, I suppose, is disconnect to reconnect. We have become so connected digitally and to society and to the false narrative. Now, part of your theme is, you know, creating personal, unique, ethical narrative storytelling. We're all being submerged by the tsunami and tidal wave of the false narrative that is being imposed upon us. We're all, you know, I was driving the other day, stopped at an intersection. There's a man with a very little child. The little child's running. They were crossing the street. The child's running ahead. He's on his phone. He's not even watching the child crossing the street. I'm thinking, wow, this is really dangerous. But the point that it is that we're all, you know, I call it the the umbilical phone attached to everybody's ear. So, and uh, in my last blog uh, or, or something that I wrote the other day, I actually looked up the stats for the amount of time that the average American and Western person spends on a monitor. You want to guess on average what that is per day? Uh, per day? Uh, on a monitor. Um, so phone, television, computer, any type of monitor. Any type eight of hours. Eight no. hours. No, it's it's more like uh, it's more towards seventeen. No, sorry, ten. Ten to twelve. Ten to twelve. So you so twenty four hours, seven for sleep, seventeen hours a day. The average person is spending, let's say, about a dozen, ten, twelve hours a day on some. So working on a computer, being on their mobile, watching television. So going back, sorry, to your question about so rustic spirit and to me is we need to disconnect from all of this digital input and noise and reconnect with nature, reconnect with silence, reconnect with the earth in order to be rejuvenated. That's, I, I love that. And of course, I want to add this though. The one cool thing about the advancements in technology is it's giving us the opportunity to be able to do that if we don't fall into the trap of just getting addicted to creating. Because the one thing, like with AI and some of the tools that I have, I mean, I what used to take me days of work, I can do in 30 minutes now. And so one of the habits, because I love hard, I love, I love working hard. I love to create. I love, Man, but one of the traps of is that I can keep going, 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 never yeah. stop. But the, the, the trick is, I have a real opportunity to step away from technology now that I may not have had before to reintegrate with nature, going outside, going for walks, spending time with family, hanging out with kids, you know, my kids hanging out with whatever. Like I have those opportunities now. So I like, I like what you said, but that opportunity is available for all of us now in a very, very special way. Like we don't even have to get into the nine to five crap anymore. Can you just check? whether you've still got me or not. I can see you. Oh, no, did I lose you? Yeah, I've got a red button here saying no internet. Can you hear me? I I can hear you. Okay, we'll keep going then. All right, so it's all about but the addictive person. Go it's ahead, all about go ahead. The addictive. 
all about addiction. You're right. I mean, you know, whether we talk about money or whether we talk about food or whether we talk about sexual activity, whether we talk about digital, everything, there's nothing that's good or bad in itself. It's our relationship with it. And that's what I'm talking about. Life works, this ability to drive your life. So fantastic that you and I can sit here and talk to each other across opposite ends of the planet via technology. There's nothing wrong with technology, nothing wrong with digital, and it's a fantastic medium to be connected. But as you say, you need to be able to drive your life in the sense that I need to know, okay, I need to turn that off now and go walk outside. I need to disconnect, right? Because it's like anything. If, if you spend too much time in doing anything, the quality deteriorates. So, yes, we get sucked into the monitor, but the the uh the efficiency and the quality of what we can deliver depletes so we need to know when to stop any activity and then go and do something else and then come back to it so i'm not saying that digital is wrong or that you know we should go back nobody wants i'm not a, i'm not a regressive person at all <laughs> quite the opposite I, I think that like you we need to avail ourselves of what the modern culture and civilization has given us but also not at the expense of our roots. And we are, at the end of the day, a social animal. We do have a physical body and we need to spend time in nature. 100%, 100%. Next question. If you could predict one major shift in human consciousness over the next decade, what would it be and why? Oh, well, that's the whole point of my work. I believe that within the next decade, Humanity is going to go through the biggest quantum shift, evolutionary quantum shift in its entire history. So that's a pretty big prediction. That's a pretty big stake. Um, but I totally believe that. And I think that the theme of that paradigm shift is going to be what I call singularity. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to go into that right now. We might go into that further on. <laughs> <laughs> I could, that's my favorite. That's my favorite subject, actually, to talk about. Um, I bet my whole life and everything I've I built for the future instead of today. Yeah. Well, I mean, actually, started years ago because I knew what was coming. It's coming, and and, and, and we are now on the cusp of the wave. You know, to me, I'm like you. I'm, you know, I've been preparing for this all my life and in training, and quite often I'll be doing something. And go, oh my. God, why am I doing this? Why are you getting me to do this? And it's like always the answer was, you're in training, you're in training, you're in training, you know. So everything that I've done in my life, everything that I've learned, everything that I've been totally focused on is because, and we are now in the eye of the storm. I mean, you guys are right in it now with this upcoming election. We don't want to get distracted by geopolitics, but it's incredibly pivotal and, you know, America is, you know, in, in the eye of the storm and it's like you're in the centre of the whirlwind, the hurricane, and we're all just flying around on the periphery hoping, hope these guys don't fall over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to comment on our election. No, no, no. <laughs> Let's not go there. We'll get lost. My opinion is not popular with either no. side. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. which philosophers or thinkers have you most – I'm oh, sorry – which philosophers or thinkers have most influenced your work and how have they shaped your views? Oh, the man behind you. Definitely the man behind you. Yeah. Um, look, I think the uh, that whole principle of the, of the Socratic dialogue of um, doing what we're doing, which is basically question and answer. You yeah. know, it's, it's, to me, it's like you have a thesis, you have an antithesis, and and through that conversation, through that dialogue, through that debate, you create a synthesis. And the whole basis of democracy, the whole basis of of going back, the beauty of the Western paradigm, is and supposedly should be this ability to dialogue, this ability to differ, this ability to have a difference of opinion, but with respect, mm. with intelligence, with dialogue and discourse, so that we can both move from our original position and both meet somewhere in the middle but at a higher plane. So as Einstein said, you cannot solve a problem on the level of consciousness at which it exists. You need to move to a higher level and you need that interaction with another human being in that process of dialogue to move. So it's it's the Socratic dialogue. So good. 
This is such a good answer. What is the what is your writing process like for your philological? Gosh, my my speech is uh, a little affected today. I apologize. I'm having trouble talking. That's all right. That's because I'm getting you excited. <laughs> that will actually part of the problem is emotion driven, and the more yeah, excited I get, it's I it's see, something. I can there. see that. We we need to calm it down a bit. So <laughs> I do. It's it, it's interesting. Whole, this is a sidebar. It's really really interesting. Is because I can't hide when I'm upset or mad now, or any type of emotion because it shows. And in my when when my speech is affected, that is a telltale sign. Either I'm too excited, too emotional, whatever. I have a hard time hiding it. So, but Josh, but Joshua, as a side, you know, this is not one answer to your question. But wouldn't the world be a better place if we all couldn't hide our uh, uh, authentic feelings and emotions, you know, so I, I think it's fantastic. You know, we need to be more open. We need to be no, more vulnerable. And as I said in the very beginning, how can you be an empowered individual if you're denying your emotions and feelings? Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm going to get this question. I'm going to get the word out. Okay. Yeah. What is your writing process like for your Phil, so, Phil, Phil La, La, philosophical okay thank you i can't believe okay. that word works how do you okay. balance research with your personal insight good okay two there's two 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 answers to that question the first is the uh compartmentalization i like to be in my office by i like to write early in the morning mm. um or or sorry to probably answer your question and the research is interesting. I spend my whole life reading, but at the end of the day, when I want to write, when I want to create, I try to disconnect from all of that and go into silence, go into a meditative space, get my inner connection to my core, to whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, and then sit and let it flow. I'm not at that point in time be thinking about what somebody else said or what I've, I've read somewhere, but invariably as I'm flowing and writing, something will come in and I might refer to that person, but I do not have anything open, meaning Google or other books or anything else when I'm actually in the process of writing. Uh, I actually like to do the original draft with pencil and paper, and I mean pencil, not even pen. So not writing the draft every word, but my outline, my schema, my chapters, or I like to actually what I call flow chart it, so how the ideas go from one. And I quite often feel very frustrated because if I draw it, it's really, really clear, and then I've got to translate it into uh, grammar and logic and sentences. And so that's where I need to just stop so I might refer to my to my schema, what I call in my blueprint or my my and it and it and it's usually just individual words and arrows and things like that to keep me on track of of where I need to go so I don't get lost in the process. Really cool. In an age of rapid technological advancement, how do you see technology influencing our understanding? of personal sovereignty in human existence? Look, I think it's a, it's a, that's a very good question and that's actually a very hard question because evolution is fantastic. I mean, evolution is going on. To me, life, God, evolution, they're all just one and the same thing. And, you know, life's going to move on, you know. True. and. Right now, we're in a technological explosion, which is part of our evolution. The trick, I think, always is is to master that. We can look at cars, we can look at airplanes, we can look at this unbelievable technology that we've been through over the last, you know, 50 to 100 years. The ability to be able to use that for one's own benefit, empowerment, enjoyment and use of life and not to get trapped by it not to get lost in it and not to use it any everything can be used for positive or negative purposes mm -hmm. you know everything can be can be beneficial and everything can be destructive 
you know, it, it's purely up to how the individual engages with it. Technology is the same, you know. You, you, I think you got to be intelligent about it. And I mean, I'm a baby boomer, so my ability to use technology is pretty limited. But I still make a valiant effort to, you know. Whereas with my kids and my grandkids, it's like, ah, oh, you know, bang, 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 bang. You know, it's like <laughs> they don't even know, need to know how to do it. Somehow, it's second nature. Such a good answer. I have so much alignment with that. Um, especially when I do, when I speak on AI and speak to the fear that people have it, that's one of the points I bring up. So that's so well stated. Next question. How do you integrate spirituality into your, <laughs> I'm going to say it right this time. Hold on. <laughs> oh, I forgot how to, I can forgot to talk to, okay. How do you integrate spirituality into your physiology this this i can't why can't i phil, phil, why can't i say that word today philosophical poof, how do you integrate spirituality into your philosophical teachings and what role does it play in your understanding of the human existence okay i don't see any difference to me they are not even two sides of the one coin they're the same thing when i was very young i said it's easy to be a mystic and yeah. it's easy to be a capitalist but <laughs> i wanted to be a, i wanted to, to be a mystical capitalist or a capitalistic mystic meaning i wanted to find a spirituality that was pragmatic and practical and worked in daily reality so that it wasn't a religion it wasn't some fantasy it wasn't written thousands of years ago. It was grounded in my day-to-day -day life that it meant it worked for me. So for me, I always wanted to build this bridge between what we call the spiritual and the material. I don't see them, and, and what I've learned is they're one and the same thing. Philosophy, for me, spirituality is philosophy, and philosophy is spirituality, because what does the word philosophy mean? Philosophy means lover of life, how does life work? What is life all about? What does spirituality mean? Spirituality is the basis of life. And what we need to do, what, coming back to one of your earlier questions, what humanity really needs to do is to understand that there is no divorce. There is no divorce between inner and outer, between spirit and matter, between my daily reality and, you know, God in heaven, for want of a better word. It is just all one. It is all the same. And as we integrate it all, Basically, philosophy is your relationship with life. Wow. I really like that answer. Huh. Especially with me butchering the word, you still had a perfect answer. Jeez. What has been the most challenging? Nope. How do you think you're... Now I'm afraid of the word because... <laughs> I have, I, I'm, like, I'm like a pitcher of a, of a baseball pitcher that has the yips or it's like somebody that, that, that is trying to putt and they just keep missing because they get in their head. Now I'm yeah. seeing the word and I don't want to ask the questions. Hold on, I'm going to do it. I'm going to quit being aware. All right. What has been the most challenging philosophical concept you grapple with and how do you overcome it? The nature of the individual. And because we are individuals, we are, listen to the kookaburras. Can you hear that? No. No, what a pity. Um, the nature of individuality, because this is the, this is the trap, this is where we get lost. And so all of my work, starting with personal sovereignty and now about Tao tuning in, and, and it's, I mean, you talk about it in your work. It's like the empowerment of the individual. And so how does one transcend or amalgamate being sovereign, which means honoring one's individuality, but at the same time understanding that 
an individual is a part of a species we are we are a part of the human species we are a part of the earth and and the ecosystem and what's going on and we are also obviously part of the universe and so we've got individuality and universe universality and we need to find the balance of the two i don't want to be egotistical you know i my, all of my work is is centered around teaching personal and individual empowerment but that doesn't mean that you want to become a dickhead or that you want to become an egotist or that you want to become you know totally obsessed about yourself at the expense of others but you do need to what i say honor yourself and that's a very intricate and hard thing to do in a humble but um sovereign way yeah yeah wow that's good all right next question within your philosophy <laughs> how can your ideas be applied to address global issues such as climate change or social inequality okay two very good areas number one climate change is easy as i said before if we the only way that any individual can pollute is if they are divorced from mother nature once you have not an intellectual understanding but a visceral biological physical connection with nature with the earth with your ecosystem and the environment within which you live you totally get the preciousness of life the sanctity of all life forms the fact that we are one piece in this incredible mosaic and that one needs to really tread on the earth softly and it just changes your attitude you just, I mean, not only have I devoted my life to, to creating this philosophy, I've also devoted my life to building this massive, beautiful 10-acre garden ecosystem. And I spend a lot of time immersed in nature because I believe that that is a very, very important training. So one of my concepts I call it is what I call the divine husbandman. We need to be a part of nature. So when you're a part of nature, this whole thing about global change, I actually, I don't call it global warming. I call it global warning, meaning the planet Earth is warning humanity. Stop, guys. This is really starting to get out of control. You are tinkering too much with planetary ecosystems, and global warming just happens to be one, I think, relatively minor aspect of it. I think we're focusing too much on that but global change uh inherent instability in in weather patterns um all these things are a definite reality and we need to focus on them. second uh was it global inequality which bit do you want me to address is it like global inequality yeah we, this, yeah you can do, i didn't use that word but it essentially means the same thing so yeah. please well Okay, so without again getting into geopolitics, but going back to your <laughs> fundamental premise about individual empowerment, and I loved your concept of the renaissance of the individual, because if you go back to the renaissance of the Middle Ages, the whole thrust for the next 500 years was the empowerment of the individual. And we did become, you know, the whole story of America, democracy, capitalism the western society has been based around individual human rights yes. and it and that and the equality of, of the individual and also for me democracy and capitalism depend upon a vibrant thriving and very successful middle class and that means that the wealth that we are creating is not necessarily evenly distributed i mean is that that's socialism and it doesn't work but it also doesn't work when you have this huge disparity which is getting worse and worse every single day where you have these massive inequality of income within countries 
for example, yours or ours, but also globally within different types of people. And so we're just, we are definitely heading in the wrong direction in both of those issues. One is our relationship with the planet. We need to get real here and go, at the end of the day, we are a, for want of a better word, an animal or a being on a planet. We need to address that with some intelligence and some rationality. We also need to realize, as I said before in the last question, that we are one. I am one of seven billion. You are one of seven billion. But at the end of the day, we are one species. And we need to start what I'm calling species think. In other words, when you are thinking, when you're addressing something, think about it from a species. If you have massive inequality, whether that inequality is food, whether that inequality is water, whether that inequality is medicine, whether that inequality is wealth, then you end up necessarily having blockages, disruptions, discontent, which will eventually lead to some sort of civil strife because basically it's unsustainable, you know. Yeah. So, so oh, that, I, sorry, you no, no, I finished. I finished. Um, I want to ask you something just because, like, I agree with what you just said. But I also know in the back of my mind, because it's part of the area that I'm, unfortunately, a world I was exposed to, is that certain governments have the power to manipulate weather and engineer storms and engineer disaster. And I won't go down that path. I'll just stop there. And sometimes the food shortages and things that we have are also done intentionally so while we have the truth of what you just said there's that truth also and it makes me wonder like i mean it's obviously there's some type of it's being done by design but those two things are at conflict yes we have these real issues happening that you just discussed but then there's also certain people that are engineering these problems how as as two people that are not involved in either we just want the best for humanity we want to make the world a better place we love our fellow brothers and sisters even the ones that we don't know like, what are we to do in that situation where, because if I speak out against the man-made stuff, I look like a crazy person but to some and other people go, yeah, yeah. But then what it does by doing that, then it dismisses the fact that there's real issues happening that are not manufactured. So then if I focus all on this, on the natural aspect of it, I'm neglecting the side of me that goes, yeah, but there's also some bad actors that are involved in making this stuff happen. In your opinion, what do we do about that? Okay. I think we need to unpack that. The first thing is that <laughs> I, I believe that all of it, all of these, that's why I said this global warning, not global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it, whatever want to label you want to put on it, is 100 percent a result of these bad actors because oh. in the, at the end of the day to a certain extent we're all responsible we all have a little bad actor ah uh, you're right? brilliant i love and, that you just did this okay keep going know, sorry you know but some of us that bad actor has totally got control has usurped control completely of my consciousness and i might I mean, we have billionaires, You, particularly in America, you have multi-billionaires who need more money. You have the elite with infinite power to dominate the planet. They want more power. So we're going back to your question about addiction. You know, these people are so addicted to money, to greed, to power, to dominance, that they are literally 100% using every technique they can to dominate the human race by fear by generating fear, by generating global change, by generating wars, by generating inequality, by making people fear, because then you're much easier to, to, to dominate. The second thing is that in our essence, I 
talk about the fact that I believe humanity has got lost. Yeah. Okay. Individually, going back to the sins of the Father, individually and collectively, so we can look at it from a species perspective and the effect that that species is having on the earth, on the ecosystem. Or we can look at it as an individual perspective of my individual life. And what I am basically saying is that life is no longer working on either of those levels for humanity. Because individually, you know, WHO has declared that the number one epidemic or pandemic is loneliness, depression. How possibly can it be that going back to your earlier question about the most advanced technological society with the most of everything that has ever existed on the planet, can the most of us be depressed, be lonely, be suicidal? It really does not make sense. So from an individual perspective, it's not working. If we look at it from a species perspective, we've only got to look at the United States deficit. We've only got to look at, you know, the actions of the Federal Reserve. We only need to look at this massive inequality. It's not working from a species perspective. It's not working from an individual perspective. So we really need to stop and go, hang on, we need to make this all work. Yeah. And to answer your question, I think the only thing that we can do is what you and I are doing which is we are speaking up. You know, you, you talk about people saying you're crazy. When I, was a, when I was a child, the number one thing that my mother used to keep saying to me was, for someone who's supposedly so intelligent, I don't know how you can be so stupid, because I would be then making these statements, which, was, which were and still are. So, you know, one of my favourite sayings is, have the guts to join the dots. Now, we do not need to go down the rabbit holes, you know, we... And I don't think it. I don't think it's wise to do that because it's pretty depressing, yeah. and one gets really sucked into the emotional trap. <clears throat> we all know it's there. I think you've got to be cognizant and realistic and go. I know you're there. I know you're the boogie man in the room, but I don't need to become obsessed about you. I need to focus on counterbalancing your activity by creating positive, good whatever you want to call it. We are trying to have an intelligent conversation here. Hopefully we are going to inspire some people. Hopefully we're putting a little bit of weight on the other side of the seesaw. So there's the force of greed, the force of negativity, the force of domination, and you've also got what you're saying, which is the empowerment of the individual, peace and people power, having ethical narratives, having a better storytelling, getting more people to be authentic, getting more people to go, hey, no, I am not putting up with this any longer because at the end of the day, whether they like it or not, hopefully, even though it is only now a quasi-democracy, we still sort of live in a democratic system. You guys can vote, you know, Doesn't even mean. though it's not much of a choice, but um, you know <laughs> what I mean? We can start to exercise, and that's what personal sovereignty is all about, and uh, tuning is that we can, the individual can, by becoming empowered, start to change the world one little bit at a time. I love that. So <clears throat> I I don't call myself a philosopher, but I am. I'm drawn to them. I've always been, I mean... Uh, to be honest, even even when my when I was an evangelist, like I still I liked reading other religions, philosophers, or other thinkers that were outside of religion. Like I've always been drawn to it because, well, I mean, f true philosophers are philosophers for a reason. I mean, they're 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 it's it's they're, it's part of their gifting. And while I don't, I would rather somebody else call me a philosopher than say that myself, out of respect to the philosophers that I admire. But that said, that way of thinking is very, very powerful, and it can help shape a better world. It can help shape, it could create a, a really dark, scary world even. That said, I believe in that power of thinking because it requires contemplation, it requires being still, it requires having silence. For someone that knows nothing about philosophy and somebody that, you know, Maybe they just don't know where to really to go, but they want to learn how to think that way, to expand their thinking or open their mind. What do you recommend somebody do 
that's wanting to be more philosopher like as a human being? Uh, two things that are one and the same time contradictory, but as in most things in life, uh, as you evolve, it becomes more subtle. And so you need to be able to straddle both sides. I think the first and most important thing, wow. which is what all my work is about, particularly in dial tuning, as you just said, one needs to go silent. Mm. One needs to develop the ability to stop what I call the yammer yammer of the mind so that one is at peace, in contentment, in silence. And again, we don't need to talk about mysticism or religion or spirituality. To me, that's a very private thing. I think everybody should have their own private religion or relationship with God, whatever you want to call it. It's none of my business. But everybody needs to have the techniques and the ability, again, whatever you want to call it, to go into silence, to meditate, to pray. It does not really matter going back to walking in the garden, being in nature. It doesn't matter how you get there. It doesn't matter how you do it, but you need to be able to do it and you need to be able to arrive at silence. So I think that's really, really important to, to, to arrive at what I would call a larger perspective of life, which, you know, is philosophy. On the other hand, I think, as you said, you need to be widely read. You need to, to, to study some of this ancient wisdom, which is cross-cultural. It's got nothing to do with any particular society. I mean, Socrates and Plato and some of these guys or some of the other, the, the truth is the truth. The truth crosses all paradigms and societies and cultures, and you will see that the more you study and you go, Pretty much we're all, all philosophers and all great thinkers, all mystics, all religious, all, all basically saying the same thing. I mean, it's not a complicated truth and it's very, very simple. You know, it can be, it can be said and that's why I'm calling the paradigm shift singularity, which is the oneness of life, the mm. purity of life, the innocence of life, respect for life. You know, you, pretty much everything comes back to that and you either – you either practice that, you either believe that, it either becomes inculcated in your being, in your daily reality. Uh, I'm pretty anti-religion because, you know, if I'm a mafia don, I can go to mass on a Sunday and go and kill someone on a Monday. You know, no. it's like, it's very hypocritical, whereas to me, true religion, true spirituality is how I live my life every single day. I don't need to go to a church. My church is my reality. It's my life. It's how I treat you. It's how I treat everybody. It's how I treat my pets or my animals or how I breathe. It, it, it's, it's a way of being. And so, sorry, long answer short, <clears throat> learn to go within, learn to go into the silence, learn to think for yourself, but at the same time, borrow or, or learn from as many different wise uh, people as possible and find what resonates with you. I mean, um, it, 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 some people will appeal to you more than others. I, yeah, and I, and, and one of the thing, I actually had this conversation in my last broadcast. We were talking about, um, well, what you just said about, you, you know, Jesus, Buddha, like they, talked about a lot of the same things in fact there's a book called jesus jesus the jesus and the buddha or jesus and buddha and it literally takes their sayings side by side and it's it's said differently but they match or they align or it's the yin to the yang like they balance each other out and it and here's what came out of this thought of of those readings in fact all of the readings even reading the quran the Quran and, and, and other, other texts that I've read, it seems like the, the core of the truth is you take all of that information and you put it all in one scoop, and then the truth is in there, but our leaders before us decided that, you know what, we're going to screw with everyone, and we're going to separate it. And, the, and, and, and also, in that book, I don't know if it's in that book or is what made me read this book, it was talking about this that no it's alan watts that talks about it the bible was created 
for the Eastern mind to understand and the Buddhist mind or the Taoist mind that that, that full Eastern philosophy was actually written for the Western mind. Like it got, everything got twisted around. And I don't know if that's true, but then going into reading those texts, it all looks like it was meant to be a puzzle that was supposed to be one complete thing and not separated. And, and, and I know those the people, a lot of people know me from my evangelism days. I got to tell you, working in, in the, in, in working in the church was really exposed me to things that was very disruptive for me, but getting to see that from a very practical mind, like just go read Jesus's sayings and Buddha sayings. They fit together like a glove, like they were meant to be taught together, not separately and definitely not in opposition to each other. Yeah. Especially if you factor in the gospel of Thomas. Yeah. So have you heard that saying, there are many routes up to the mountain, but the view from the top is the same. God, you know? I hope that's true. Yeah. So <laughs> there are, you know, and because we all, you know, if you if you put together what my answer to the last question, which is number one, you have to go within. Okay. So and going back to your very first question, which was about original sin. So if I go within under the premise of original sin and being fatally flawed and not trusting myself, not listening to myself, I am going to have to go and depend upon another for my paradigm, which is a religion. Yeah. If I have the ability to go within, which all of these guys did, you know, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Not meaning I am and you are not. I believe that what he meant was I am the way and the truth and the light for me. You are the way and the truth and the light for you. So, and going back to your question about the philosophers, whether or whether it's Buddha or Jesus or Krishna or Muhammad or any of these, these guys, they've all had that ability to go deeply within themselves, yeah. to contact life, to contact the divine, to really understand but unfortunately, we all suffer the same problem, which was in one of your earlier questions. How do you then translate that into words? How do I sit here and translate that experience into words? Because if if someone's blind, it's pretty hard to tell them about color. If someone's <laughs> deaf, it's pretty hard to tell them about the nuances of sound. If someone doesn't have a sense of smell, it's pretty hard to tell them about that beautiful scent that I just inhaled. Does that make sense? So. It is very experiential, and one needs to go within to experience it for oneself. Because once you experience it, you know, yeah. you know, you know, you know. It's like, and how do you put it into words? It's, it's, and, and the more you put it into words, the less it really becomes real. Because we've gone from the thing to a label you know we've gone we've brought it into the level of rational thinking um and and i read recently somewhere and i really loved it was you can't know god via your mind but you can feel it in your heart true mm. so it, it it's, a, it's a visceral thing it truth is a knowing thing it's not i can't learn when we spoke about before you asked me about how to you know we talk about reading i don't think you learn i don't think you read to parrot it's not like okay i can learn uh maths or spelling or grammar or how to use a computer wisdom is not that sort of learning wisdom comes from the digestion understanding it becoming a part of me by me taking those words that i've read going within taking them into the silence not thinking about them but allowing them to become a part of my being. So good. So good. All right, this is the last question, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to have the final word. But, and this is actually my favorite question to ask, what legacy do you hope to leave behind through your philosophy in your writings, your teachings, your mentorship, your coaching, all the things that you do, what is the legacy that you wish to leave? Oh, a different way for humanity to live. 
I, I 100% believe that I am not writing for today. Um, I'm certainly not one of these people who, you know, are obsessed about how many books I'm, I'm, I'm going to sell. I, I am definitely writing for probably 100 years time. I, I, I would like my legacy to be that I am hopefully, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be egotistical here. I'm quite humble about it, but I'm also very serious about it that I want to write the blueprint of how I believe humanity will be living in the future. Yeah. So I'm writing what I believe is the roadmap, um, the principles. This is how we need to be, not how what we need to do. It's not a political system, uh, although it incorporates everything because once you understand this, then you've got to look, well, how do we relate? And we relate via economics, we relate via culture, we relate via politics. This is how humanity relates. So obviously we need to deal with all of these things. And as I said at the very beginning, I wanted to break the divide between the spiritual and the real. And most of the cultures don't incorporate the spirituality enough into the day-to-day -day reality of, okay, how are we going to run this thing? And if we're going to run this thing as an elite, and my gain is at your expense, which is, you know, a zero-sum game, it's not going to work out very well. So it has to be a practical living philosophy that incorporates and goes through everything. How do I operate as an individual so that I don't harm, so that I don't injure, so that I create inspiration, so that I have a happy, successful joyous life that I can express myself, that I can be 100% true to myself, but I'm not doing that in an egotistical way. I'm not doing that in an injurious way. I'm doing that in a very loving way and in a celebratory way. So we're all starting to celebrate life. You know, we're all actually having a ball. We're all enjoying it, mm. but we are co-creating together. I believe that we, we do actually live in the Garden of Eden um it's just that we don't participate i boy i have like a whole hour talk on that subject alone um i adrian i i visionary to visionary futurist to futurist philosopher to philosopher like i'm in awe of you um Thank maybe you. maybe because i have so much alignment with you and the way you yeah. think and also creating for the future as opposed to now hmm. first and foremost it takes a lot of balls for lack of better words it takes guts it takes courage it takes a lot of strength to do that to be a forerunner because that means that you're talking about things that most of the world can't see and when you talk about it you look like the crazy person yeah and so in, in, in one one could only hope in our lifetime of being a futurist is that we get to see what we were saying come to light in a way because it would be I, maybe this is selfish on my end but i wrote for the future as well i built for the future i talked about the future in hopes of helping others be ready for the future i would like to be able to pre to be able to receive some hugs from the people that turn their back on me for some of the things that i shared from the heart to help them that backfired. I would like to be around to see the things I spoke about be unveiled. And and I and I believe I'm going to be, which is good, is exciting for me. Because, and maybe this is part of my ego that I get to kill. But I am looking forward to that day. I can smile and go, I told you. I I and not in the ego way, just like no. yeah. I told you. I I I I I wanted you to have this. Yeah because i cared about you i care about you i wanted you to know because well, I, yeah. I think it's part of the suffering of being that visionary that we can see the way that it and you know should's not a really great word but unfortunately you know the <laughs> way that it should be the way that it ought to be the way that it could be the way that life was supposed to be the gift that was given to us to have this enjoyable, blessed, lovely, fantastic life. 
you know. And as I said, part of the suffering is as a visionary, we see that, we can touch it, we can taste it, and then we turn around and want to give it yeah. to others. And it's like it, it – and, and so one ha – and look, not only is it uh, ballsy, but you have to have a lot of courage, I think, when you then turn around and look at all the negativity and look at what's going on in the world today and your faith in that it is going to happen is really tested. I mean, and you do. I mean, you've only got to turn the news on and you go, my God, are we ever going to, you know, like this just not going to happen, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think if you have the faith in your own vision and what you've seen and what you know can happen. So have you ever heard of the hundredth monkey? No. No. Okay. So this is a true story. Scientists were studying this tribe of monkeys, not sure what type, on an island, and these monkeys ate yams. And all of a sudden, one monkey starts washing the sand off the yam in the sea and eating it without all the sand. And then the other monkeys see and copy very quickly on another island unrelated physically impossible for it to be transmitted via sight or any other way the monkeys on another island start doing the same thing spiritually there's a thing called a morphogenic field which i'm not going to go into but basically what the hundredth monkey means is that as individuals like you and like me change and as we create a new reality within ourselves that becomes a prototype that reality is created created on the morphogenic field of humanity and so we are the way showers we are the map makers we are creating new ground of the way that the new human so basically all of my work is focused on what i call creating the new human the way the new human is going to be. And I need to learn and to have the discipline and the power, going back to your concept at the beginning of personal empowerment, I need to have the personal discipline and the personal power to live my life that way every single moment of every single day. doesn't really matter whether anybody sees it. doesn't really matter whether anybody knows it. It's just that I need to create that field or that template or that model which goes out into the ether, so to speak, and starts to change the way, the evolution of humanity. I love it. I, I actually I wrote a I co-author of a book I wrote with a friend of mine um, about the seven types of human, and it gets into what you were talking about. So, and I won't go into that now, but I, I honor you. Um, I would love for you to have the last word, and like, I mean, literally the last word, you you i mean last words i won't say anything after this <laughs> but please plug your books where people can find you where people can support you follow your journey and then if you have anything on your heart you feel led to share share it the floor is yours sir okay so uh i'm in the middle this is book two called da tuning which comes out on the 17th of september uh, it will be available on Amazon, all bookstores. So it is book two in a trilogy, which I have called the Temple of Understanding. Mm. I believe that we live within a massive misunderstanding. We are living our lives backwards. The first book, Personal Sovereignty, teaches you how to be true to yourself, how to make decisions. The second book, Dar Tuning, which is coming out now, as I said, this September, is a manual on how to live your life right, how to do these things. doesn't need to be, it's not philosophical, although it is, but it's very pragmatic, it's very practical, it's got a lot of how-tos, how to do, how to, how to enjoy your life more, how to be more successful, how to be happier, how to drive this thing called life. And so I would love people, that's how I can share my knowledge, I've spent my whole life uh, putting this understanding together. So I guess my last word would be this is not, it's not a religion. It's not a philosophy. It's not hard to understand. It's very, very practical day-to-day -day reality on how to improve your life 
so that your life can be more enjoyable and more successful. And I would love everybody to enjoy their life as much as they possibly can.